Okay, chemistry 111, continuing on with our general chemistry um, final exam review. We're on question number 41, given a reaction, determine the net ionic equation. Shown here is a balanced molecular equation that would occur between calcium chloride and sodium carbonate. Which of the following is the balanced net ionic equation? Uh, then they've given us the molecular equation. Well, you can see that the only ions that aren't going to cancel out are going to be um, the calcium and the uh, carbonate ion because that is going to form the calcium carbonate. And so you see that the sodium is only involved in ionic compounds that are aqueous, and the chloride is only involved in ionic compounds that are aqueous. And so we're not going to see any sodiums or chlorides. We're only going to see calcium and carbonate ions. And so the answer would be number three, that calcium plus carbonate produces calcium carbonate, which of course is a solid. Um, what else? Number 42, given the concentration of a product, determine the concentration of ions. I didn't give myself a lot of space to solve this one here, but it says, what is the concentration of potassium ions in a 2.47 molar solution of potassium phosphate? So look, if I have potassium phosphate, K3, or sorry, potassium phosphate, K3PO3, if that's an aqueous solution, that's going to dissociate to give me three potassium ions plus one phosphite ion, like that. So that tells me that for every one unit of concentration of potassium phosphate, I have three times the concentration of potassium ions. So the concentration of my potassium ions is going to be equal to 2.47 molar, oops, molar potassium phosphate times for every one mole of potassium phosphate that I have, it's going to dissociate to give me three moles of potassium ion. So I just take 2.47 and I multiply it by three and I get 7.41 molar as the concentration for my potassium ions, K plus ions. Number 43, given a mass um, and a volume, determine the concentration or the molarity of a solution. Remember that molarity is the number of moles per liter. So we have a 250 milliliter solution made of four point, made with 4.27 grams of cesium chloride. I've gone ahead and looked up the molar mass of cesium chloride, which is 168.35 grams per mole. Now you can do this stepwise. You can take the mass of cesium chloride divided by the molar mass, gives you the number of moles, divide that by the volume. That works totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I like to try to do everything in one fell swoop here. So I'll say the concentration of my cesium chloride is going to be equal to 4.27 grams divided by 168.35 grams per mole in my numerator. Grams cancel. I have moles on top divided by the volume of my, um, of my solution in liters. So 250 milliliters, and you should know that in one liter, you have 1,000 milliliters. So all you do is divide 250 by 1,000, and you get 0 0.250 liters. You punch all that spinach into your calculator, and you end up with 0 0.101 molar. I'm going to assume that the 250 has three sig figs, so I'm going to put a decimal in it there. Number 44, a dilution problem, right? You need to know how to use the formula M1V1 is equal to M2V2 or M2, or sorry, M1C1 is equal to M2C2, whatever. It says, what volume of 1.55 molar solution is used to prepare um, 1,350 milliliters of a 0.75 molar solution. Well, we have the con the uh, volume in milliliters. We don't need to change that around because we can just use the formula that I've put up here. We can take that formula and we can solve for V1. So we're going to say V1 is equal to M2 times V2 divided by M1. Our final concentration is 0 0.75 zero molar multiplied by our final volume, which is 1,350 milliliters. We divide all that spinach by 1.55 molar. Moles per liter cancel. I end up with my 
volume that I require, which is 653 milliliters of that first solution. Number 45, if you're given a neutralization reaction, determine the amount of reactant to completely neutralize the other reactant. Uh, what concentration of 32 mils of barium hydroxide solution is required to completely neutralize 150 mils of um, 0.425 molar nitric acid? Well, I think we need a little more space to solve this one. So I'm going to switch over to a blank doc. Just give me two shakes of a lamb's tail here. Didn't mean to do that. Go. All right. So what's our acid and what's our base? We have nitric acid, HNO3, which is combining with barium hydroxide. Okay. My acid is monoproduct, but my base has two hydroxides in it. So I'm going to need twice the amount of nitric acid as I do barium hydroxide, which is going to end up producing barium nitrate plus two moles of water. So there's my neutralization reaction, okay? My neutralization reaction, there's my beautiful balanced equation. So again, the ratio of the nitric acid to the barium hydroxide is two to one. Well, if I'm starting out with 150.0 uh, milliliters of 0.425 nitric acid, 0.425 molar nitric acid. I'm going to convert the volume into liters. So I have 0 0.1500 liters of HNO3. I know the concentration for every one mole of HNO3. I have um, 0.425 moles of HNO3. Sorry about that. I have um, one liter of HNO3. I want to know the number of moles of uh, barium hydroxide that's required. So I know that for every two moles of nitric acid it gets consumed, I'm only going to consume one mole of barium hydroxide. So let's do this as two parts. If I punch this all into my calculator, I end up with the number of moles of barium hydroxide as being 0 0.03188 moles of barium hydroxide. Now they told me at the beginning of the problem that the volume of the barium hydroxide that I have is 32.00 milliliters, which is the same thing as 0 0.03200 liters. All right, so now if I want the concentration of the barium hydroxide, it's going to be equal to the number of moles divided by the volume. I have my number of moles, 0 0.3188 moles, divided by my volume, 0 0.03200 liters, like that. And I get that my concentration is equal to 0 0.9963 molar is the concentration of the base that I need if I'm going to add exactly 32 milliliters to my 150 milliliters of 0 0.25, 0 0.425 molar nitric acid. So again, this was question number 45. Okay, so we solved that one. We determined that the concentration was equal to 0 0.9963 molar. Number 46, given a pictorial representation of a reactant, determine the amount of reactant needed. Well, I don't have a representation of that, but if we look at, uh, you know, pictures that represent the number of molecules, you can just, you know, determine how many of this molecule, how many of this molecule, and then do kind of a limiting reactant thing. Uh, number 47, given the amounts of two reactants, determine the limiting reactant, um, the amount of product formed, and the amount of excess reactant. So we have three copper plus aluminum oxide produces three moles of copper, two oxide plus two aluminum. So if we have 300 moles If we have 300 moles of copper and 200 moles of aluminum oxide, how many moles of copper um, to oxide are produced? So let's 
write this out as neatly as possible. So if I have three moles of copper plus aluminum oxide producing three moles of copper two oxide plus two moles of aluminum. If initially I'm starting out with 300 moles of copper, we'll just write 300, and I've got 200 moles of aluminum oxide, how many moles of copper two oxide are produced? Well, if I need three times as much of this as I do this, that means that my copper is going to be my limiting reactant because when I lose all 300 of these, I'm only going to lose one third of the same amount of aluminum oxide. I'm only going to lose 100, right? I'm going to form the same amount of copper oxide because the ratio is one to one or three to three. Okay. And what else? I'm going to end up gaining so if i'm losing 100 then i'm going to gain 200 of these is my change so at equilibrium i'm going to have none of this i'm going to have 100 moles of aluminum oxide left over and i'm going to have 300 moles of copper two oxide so the answer is 300 moles of copper two oxide um Yeah, that's the answer. 300 moles of copper two oxide is formed. And we'll say that um, the copper is the limiting reactant. All right. Uh, let's see here. Determine the amount of excess reagent. Oh, I have to keep rewriting these things. So if I have the same the same reaction, so I have three copper plus aluminum oxide gives me three copper, two oxides plus aluminum. So let me see if I can copy this and paste it. Oop. I think I already solved this one in the last one, but if you have your 300 moles of copper and your 200 moles, what is the amount of excess reactant? Well, it's the aluminum oxide that was in excess. You started it with 200, you only had to use half of that and so 200 minus 100 means you got 100 moles of aluminum oxide in excess. All right, so the answer here was 300 moles, and the answer here is 100 moles of aluminum oxide. Number 48, given a balanced chemical reaction and the amount of one reactant to determine the amount of the other reactant required for the reaction to proceed, if you've got 45 grams, of copper reacting, how many grams of aluminum oxide will complete the reaction? So this is nothing more than a stoichiometry problem. Um, we know the molar mass of copper. So copper has a molar mass of 63.55 grams per mole. Aluminum oxide, because we need the mass of aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide weighs 101, 101.96 grams per mole. Let's punch some numbers in here. We've got 45 grams of copper. We know that in one mole of copper, you've got 63.55 grams of copper. If we were to stop here, we wouldn't have gotten very far, would we? We've only had, we'd only have moles of copper, but thanks to my balanced equation, I know that for every three moles of copper that's consumed, I'm going to consume one mole of my aluminum oxide, right? Now, if I was to stop here, I'd have the number of moles of aluminum oxide, but we know the molar mass of aluminum oxide. We know that in one mole of aluminum oxide, we have 101.96 grams of aluminum oxide. And therefore, this is going to cancel, and we're going to end up with the mass of aluminum oxide, which is 24 grams of aluminum oxide. And it should only have two sig figs because we're only given two sig figs with our mass. So 24 grams of aluminum oxide. Number 49, given a balanced chemical reaction in the amount of one reactant, determine the amount of uh, product formed. So I have three grams. So how much copper two oxide will be produced? 
same rationale as the last problem. We'll go over it kind of quickly. You have the 45 grams of copper. We could just take this whole thing here and copy this. Get it? Copy, copper. There we go. So we just start with this and then we can continue on from there. We know that for every one, sorry, for every three moles of copper that's used, we're going to form three moles of copper two oxide. And we know that in one mole of copper two oxide, I've gone ahead and looked at the molar mass of copper two oxide. It's 79.545 grams of copper two oxide. Not magic. You can see that these units all cancel out. And when you punch that spinach in your calculator, you left over with 56 grams of copper two oxide. Number 50, given amounts of two reactants, determine the amount of excess reactant. Shoot. Uh, so let's see here. Same thing. If I have 0.25 moles of copper and 0.25 moles of aluminum oxide, so same equation. Write it down again. I have my three copper plus aluminum oxide gives you three copper two oxides plus two aluminum. If I have, what does it say? 250 moles of copper. And if I have 0 0.250 moles of copper, and if I have 0 0.250 moles of aluminum oxide, what is the one that's going to be in excess? Well, if I need three times as much copper to react, I'm going to have Ask me what's the amount of excess. Oh, shit. Okay, so uh, you can see that copper is going to be the limiting reactant, but it's asking you what is the amount of excess reactant. So if we have our 0 0.250 moles of copper that we're starting out with, and it's all going to get used up first. And we have for every three moles of copper, we have one mole of aluminum oxide that's being formed. And so we end up with 0 0.08, 0 0.0833 moles of aluminum oxide that's end up that's going to end up getting used. So put here is used. So what's the amount, the excess amount of aluminum oxide left over? is going to be what we started with, which is 0 0.250 moles. Subtract 0 0.0833 moles. You subtract that from it, and what you were left over with at the end is 0 0.167 moles. So that's how much you've got at the end. Man, I got a lot of questions in here about limiting reactants and so on and so forth. So make sure you're rock solid on your stoichiometry. Question 51, given a balanced chemical reaction and a percent yield, and the amount of product formed, determine the amount of reactant needed for a solution. Uh, a process converts, so C6H14, so that's called hexane into carbon dioxide with a 65% yield. What mass of hexane is required to produce uh, 589 grams of carbon dioxide? And they give you the molar mass of the carbon dioxide, and they give you a beautiful balanced equation. So let's see. If we want to make 589.0 grams of carbon dioxide, they've given us the molar mass of carbon dioxide. One mole of CO2 has a mass of 44.01 grams of CO2. We know that for every 12 moles of CO2 that's produced, we needed two moles of the hexane C6H14. Okay, and they're asking us for the mass of the hexane. And we know that in every one mole of C6H14, we have a mass of 86.172 grams of C6H14. All right, let's uh, cancel this and this. Did I leave moles out here? Sounds like something I might do in the 12th hour. Moles of CO2, there we go, that looks better. 
This cancels, we end up with the mass, which is 192 grams of C6H14. But this is our theoretical yield, right? This is um, a theoretical yield. And they're telling us that you only get 65% of this. So you're gonna have to divide this by 0.65, right? If you divide this by 65%, which is 65 divided by 100, you end up with 296 grams, right? Take your calculator and punch in 296 times 0.65. What do you get? You get 192. So remember, when we do the reaction, you would have to start out with um, this much of the C6H14, okay? In order to end up with 589 grams of CO2 because the yield is only 65%. Number 52, given a chemical equation, the amount of one reactant and the amount of product formed determine the percent yield. Uh, it says here 9.35 grams of A, or sorry, 9.35 grams of aluminum reacts with oxygen to make 13.2 grams of aluminum oxide, um, what is the percent yield? So first we need a balanced equation. We have aluminum, which is a solid, combining with oxygen, which is a gas, to make Al2O3. Okay, so I would use a two here and I would put a three over two there. Now you can multiply the whole thing in order to eliminate the fractions. So you'd have a four, a three, and a two. So four, three, and a two like that. So now everything's balanced out with whole numbers. We're given 9.35 grams of aluminum and it reacts with oxygen to make 13.2 grams of aluminum oxide. What's the percent yield? Well, first let's figure out what the theoretical yield is. If we have 9.35 grams of aluminum, we know that in one mole of aluminum by looking at our periodic table, or this here, it says we have a mass of 26.98 grams of aluminum. If we were to stop right here, all we'd have is the number of moles of aluminum, but we know that for every four moles of aluminum that we consume, we form two moles of aluminum oxide. And we know that in one mole of aluminum oxide, we have a mass of 101.96 grams of aluminum oxide moles of aluminum and moles of aluminum oxide cancel and we end up with the mass of aluminum oxide which is 17.7 grams of aluminum oxide. So what's our percent yield? The percent yield is equal to the actual yield actual yield divided by the theoretical yield multiplied by 100%. So that's equal to 13.2 grams divided by 17.7 grams multiplied by 100%. You see that grams cancel, you end up with percent, and the percent yield is 74.6%. 74 53, conceptual understanding of the relationship between molar mass, number of molecules, volume of gas. You need to know the ideal gas law, PV is equal to nRT. You need to know things like Boyle's law, P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2, right? You need to know um, Avogadro's law, so um, V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2, so on and so forth. Number 54, what else? Given a volume, pressure, and temperature of a gas, you've got to be able to solve for the number of moles. You have 3,500 milliliters uh, as the volume of a balloon at 28 degrees Celsius has a pressure of 5.36 atmospheres. How many moles are in the balloon, right? You'd solve using N. N is equal to PV over RT. So to solve for N, you would say N is equal to P 5.36 atmospheres multiplied by V which is 3.500 liters. I just converted that in my head. Divided by R, which is 0 0.08206 liter atmosphere per mole K, multiplied by the temperature, 28 degrees Celsius, plus 273. 
301 Kelvin. All right, I'm too tired to do math in my head anymore. So there we go. Atmospheres cancel, volume cancels, and I'm left over with the number of moles. And I get that the number of moles is equal to 0 0.759 moles. So know how to rearrange the ideal gas law. Number 55, uh, let's see here. Given a graph showing the molecular speed of various gases, determine the one with the highest molar mass. So the one that moves the slowest is going to be the um, molar mass or the gas with the highest molar mass. You remember Graham's law? So Graham's law, which is the rate of movement of gases or the rate the rate of movement of gases is equal to the inverse of the square root of their molar masses, which is equal to T1 or T2 over T1. Did I say R1 over R1? I am tired. There we go.